Well, hey, it's good to have you here at Radiant Springs Church today. The kids can go with Pastor Andy, and we'll dismiss them. If you are watching online, uh, do say hi if you haven't already. And if you see somebody there, um, maybe just, you can have some dialogue there. That's okay, dialogue with one another, catch up. Um, just like you would in church, that's what uh, you, you know, you have some conversations, so that's okay to do that there. Uh, we encourage you to do that. Uh, that's one of the things that you, we tend to miss if we're just watching online. Um, you're watching the service, but you're not having that fellowship part, so that's very crucial. All right, um, just some other things. So the Christmas service, we were looking at doing that on December 20th, so that's Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. It's just part of our Sunday morning service, and so... Um, yeah, we'll be planning for that, and we're just going to make the best of it in, under the circumstances, and so it'll work. It'll just maybe look different, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. So it's always fun. Uh, my favorite part is the bell choir, but um, so uh, we'll look forward to that. And then Christmas Eve service, uh, right now that is planned for 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve. Um, that will be online. Um, if we'll just see where things are at with COVID, if we'll do that in person or not. So we'll just kind of take that one by ear, that part. All right. And I think that is it for, um, uh, for announcements, Creek Cares. Um, we shouldn't have said that during the offering, but if you want to give over the next couple of weeks towards Creek Cares, or even if you want to do a check here, um, and give it to us after the service, that's fine. Uh, we'll just be collecting money for that to uh, provide that. That is coming up on December 12th, all right? And uh, we'll need some people. If you want to help pack boxes that Saturday morning, it's going to go probably a little bit quicker where we're going to pack the boxes, and then people are going to drive through, and we're going to put them in there. We're not going to do where people are lined up ahead of time. Basically, we're going to get the word out, and if you need a box uh, for Christmas usually has ham and some of the ingredients, the necessary things, vegetables and all that type of sweet potatoes and all that type of stuff for a Christmas meal. So um, that'll be on December 12th. People just drive through, pick it up, and um, be on their way. So uh, that is coming up then. All right, we are going to be in the book of Isaiah this morning. We're going to look at a couple passages in the book of Isaiah. And so um, we're entering into a time now called Advent, Right? And so Advent means, all right, that's why I will clarify that a little bit. So Advent means coming, all right? And so often we use that term Advent to, it's a time, not just Christmas Day, but it is a, a season leading up to Christmas and that we focus in on the coming of Jesus, okay? And it's a celebration, it's to prepare our hearts for Christ's coming uh, in Christmas, but it also has that anticipation that when he came the first time, but he's also coming the second time, all right? And by the second time, we mean that Jesus is going to return, and he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth uh, for a thousand years, okay? That's what scripture tells us. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but that, that is called the second coming of Christ. And the Jews, that was, a, that was a tricky thing for them because they saw them one as the same. And so when Jesus came and they we're reading into that he was the Messiah, they stumbled over the part of the cross. So we'll talk a little more about that. This morning we're going to talk about, the title of the message is Anticipation. All right, how many look forward to Christmas, right? Okay. All right, our younger people, are you look forward to Christmas? Yeah, I know it, Archer, aren't you? Yeah, I used to really like Christmas. In fact... I was a little bit on the sneaky side. You never would think that I was sneaky, okay? But I was. So I had actually, I would scope out the presents and I would actually open them up, one of them. I would open them up and see what was there. Maybe you would even play with it and then I'd wrap it back up and put it back under the tree. All right? Yes. I don't think my parents ever cut on. But, um, but I, I looked forward to that Christmas morning, you know, and uh, sometimes as adulthood, you get into ad adulthood, maybe that isn't, that element is a little bit gone, but we look forward to other things. You know, I remember graduating from high school or wedding date, um, most recently getting done with my doctoral studies. That's a good thing to be a anticipating being done with. Um, you know, maybe we're looking for Christmas to come or maybe we're looking forward to the end of COVID, right? 
uh, when that's in our rearview mirror. Um, anticipation, though, is woven through the Old and New Testaments. Um, and so that's where I want to direct us this morning. And we'll, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to kind of look at different parts of Scripture that lead up to Christ and His coming, Advent, coming to us. So Advent means coming. It celebrates His coming to earth, but also has that forward looking to His second coming. So before we dive in, this morning we're going to look at the book of Isaiah, just some prophecies that foreshadowed, that talked about the coming of our Lord and our Savior Jesus, all right? Written hundreds of years before Christ would ever walk upon the earth, Um, but they describe who Christ would be the Messiah. So before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive in together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you that you are present here with us, Lord. Uh, And you're with us wherever we're at today, Lord. And I pray that you would just make your word come alive to us this morning. It is the living word of God. And and Father, we pray this morning, Lord, as we touch upon the truth that I believe there's going to be certain truths that are going to resonate with us, that are going to connect with us, Lord God. And I just pray for that our hearts would be open to receive what you are speaking to us today in the word that you have for us. We give you the thanks. We ask it in your precious and holy name. And everybody said... Amen. So we're going to begin in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Uh, most of our verses are going to be in chapter 7, chapter 7 through 11, um, and maybe 14, and then we jump to 53. So Isaiah 7, 10 through 17 is the first prophecy I want us to look at. And often these passages are read when we talk about Christmas, okay? And there are often quoted in the New Testament, especially Matthew, all right? So chapter 7, verses 10 through 17, it says, Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Now, Ahaz was the king of Judah, all right? So at this point, after King Solomon, you have Saul was the first king of Israel, and then you have David, and then you have David's son Solomon, all right? And under those three kings, Israel was... Uh, led by those kings, all of Israel, all 12 tribes, there was 12 tribes, and they're all led by Israel. But after Solomon, his son takes uh, rule, and he's kind of harsh and, and more harsher than Solomon was, and so now you have a divided kingdom. Two uh, tribes in the south are called Judah, and the 10 tribes in the north are called Israel. So as you're reading First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, all of a sudden you now you see king of Israel, king of Judah, now you're into that split, divided kingdom, all right? Israel was more wicked than Judah would be, all right? And so God is speaking to Ahaz. He is the king of Judah, so he's in the king of the south, okay? So this is Isaiah has a word for Ahaz. He says, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether it is the deepest depths or in the highest heights. He says, ask me for a sign and I'll prove that I'm going to be there with you. But Ahaz is going to kind of blow it off because he doesn't have a walk with God. He doesn't know if God will actually act or respond. And so so instead of asking for a sign, he just kind of says, no, I'm not going to ask for anything. So it's actually an act of disbelief, not of faith. Okay, Verse 12, but Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. So it sounds spiritual, but actually there wasn't any faith there. Then Isaiah says, well, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. God's going to give you a sign anyway. Here now house of David, so Judah. It is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you also try the patience of my God also? So therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son. And you are to call him what? Emmanuel. And he will be eating curds and honey. This is a reference that it would be a time of poverty. Okay, this this child is going to be, so whether the land is going to be desolate, curds and honey were a reference that that was a food that was found during difficult times. When he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. Before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of two kings will dread, will be laid to waste. Okay, the land of two kings. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any other since Ephraim Ephraim broke away from Judah, and he will bring the king of Assyria. All right, so what he is saying is, hey, 
within the time it takes for a woman to conceive and give birth to a son and this, the son to know the right from the wrong. So in the next couple years, right, there is something that is going to come from the north that's going to be devastating. It's going to be the king of Assyria. And so Ahaz was torn because he was getting pressure from the king of Israel in the north and the king of Aram. Okay, Those two countries were together and they had formed an alliance. They wanted Ahaz to come alongside as well because Assyria was growing in power and dominance and was threatening them. And so they thought, if we can get Ahaz on, on board, we have a better chance of defeating the king of, of Israel. But they tried, and Ahaz wasn't going to bite on it. He wasn't going to go for it. So then they're going to try pressuring through force, come to battle with him to make an ally out of him, and that failed as well. But here, God gives them a sign, a prophecy, saying to Ahaz, even though he wasn't asking for one, even though he wasn't seeking God for help, um, his father had. His father, Uzziah, walked with the Lord all of his life. But at the end of his, his success led to pride in his life. And he began to take credit for the blessings of God. And so um, he even went into the temple and offered the incense and the sacrifices, the incense actually. And the priest said, hey, you can't do that. And he says, yes, I can. I'm the king. And he got too big of a head and he got leprosy. And that's the way he would die. He would die in misery, leprosy, and aloneness because of his condition. Um, it's a terrible way to have walked with God all of your life and then to lose it at the end. That is not how you want to end your life. And it's a, it's a very uh, solemn reminder of the role that pride can play in our life. But Ahaz, he saw his father's example. He knew he could cry out to God, and he didn't. And so God says, I'm going to give you a sign. Well, is, Assyria did come down in a few years, and they would take that northern part of Israel in 722 B.C., if you want to write that down. But in 722 B.C., they would come down and they would devastate the land of Israel, those ten tribes. They would stop short of taking Jerusalem, all right? That would happen later in 586 when the Babylonians are now the dominant force. And then that is Nebuchadnezzar. And if you were in that Daniel study, you know that Daniel and his friends and Ezekiel would be ones that were taken back to Babylon. And um, that's where they would serve under the kings of uh, the Babylonians and then the Medes, Medes and the Persians. Daniel would serve under several different kings and several different um, um, countries. But this is the sign, and so we have this prophecy, so it has immediate fulfillment. Okay, That's what's confusing about some of the prophecies in the Old Testament. Is it had immediate fulfillment that, hey, there was going to be in the time that it's going to take for a woman to conceive, give birth to a son, and for this child to know the right from the wrong, Trouble's going to come from the north in the form of Assyria, and he's going to take the land. And you'll call this son's name Emmanuel. But it also reaches, it's a prophecy that kind of foreshadows of what Christ, that there will be a sign that the virgin will give birth to a son, and you are going to call his name Emmanuel, right? And so Matthew picks up on this in Matthew twenty one twenty three. It says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. You'll call his name Emmanuel. So he quotes from Isaiah and he says this is fulfillment. This is fulfillment of uh, Christ being born and that um, he will be with us. And so the first principle, if you want to write it in your program there, is that we see from Isaiah. So Isaiah anticipated that the Messiah would be Emmanuel, God with us. He anticipated that this child to be born, the Messiah, would be Emmanuel, God with us. And that is a powerful truth, word that Isaiah would, um, would bring forth. And it, it really, I think, is uh, if you really just take some time to meditate and really flesh that out, it means that he lived with us and he walked with us. He walked in our shoes when he took on flesh and came to dwell with us. What did that mean? It mean that he endured our suffering it mean that he knew what it was to experience victory, to playing, you know, playing with his siblings. You know, I don't know if they played flag football in the backyard. I don't know what they did, or they played soccer, the other type of football, right? Um, I, I, you know, but he knew what it was like to be a child. He knew what it was like to win and to to suffer defeat as well, um, to have fights. He 
experienced our sickness. Now, we don't know if he ever became sick. You know, it's kind of like, well, he was God, but he was also human. All right? He experienced sickness. Our struggles. He grew up in a difficult time. He did not grow up with wealth and prosperity. He grew up in just a common home that had struggles, financial struggles and other struggles. He walked into where we were at, even though he was the king of heaven. He experienced our temptations. Hebrews says he was tempted in every way like us, yet he did not sin. And I think that's powerful because sometimes we, we struggle with temptation and think God doesn't understand uh, our temptations that we struggle with, whether it is pride or, or that we um, uh, financial things or, or whether it's sexual temptations. Whatever the case may be, God understands those things because he walked where we walked. And he was human, just like you and I. And you think, no way, God couldn't have some of the same temptations I did. Well, he was human, folks. And Hebrews says he was tempted in every way like us. The key thing is he did not sin. Amen? But he understands our temptations. He understands our struggles. Therefore, the author of Hebrews says we can come before him because we have one that understands us, that has walked where we have walked, He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And I think that's so powerful. And the author of Hebrews says that it is for that reason that we can boldly come before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need because He understands us and because of what He did for us on the cross of Calvary and His grace. We can boldly come before Him. He understands us and He wants us to come boldly, not fearfully, not um, reluctantly, He understands us, and He's there for us. Amen? That's a powerful truth, folks. Number two, I want us to look at Isaiah 11. So turn ahead just a few pages in your Bible or scroll ahead in your electronic version. 11, 1 through 3. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. All right, so we took out a tree yesterday, and we actually took out the stump. So otherwise, I should have taken a picture of the stump there. All right? But often when you cut down a tree, you leave the stump, unless you have a stump grinder, all right? There's a stump there, right? A shoot will come up for the stump of Jesse. So if you don't grind out the stump, you may get shoots coming up, right? Often people don't want that. From its roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, in some of your Bibles, the branch is capitalized. Let's find out why. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not be judged by what he sees with his eyes, nor decide what he hears with his ears. Now, this is another uh, prophecy um, that deals with Christ, okay? Now, in 586, when the Babylonians come in, they devastate what is left of Israel, all right? The temple, Jerusalem, it is, it is devastated. The walls are broken down. The temple is destroyed. The valuables are taken. They take the cream of the crop. So Daniel and some of those guys, they take back and incorporate into their government to train them, kind of brainwash them, make them part of their government. They leave Israel as that stump. The tree has been cut down. Just Seems dead, doesn't it? It seems all of Israel is wiped out because they're destroyed, never to come back again. But here's the thing, is that God left the stump. And out of that stump was going to come a shoot and a tree would form, this branch. Who is that branch? It is a reference to Christ. It's a reference to the Messiah that would spring out of this stump, out of this remnant, okay? And God would be faithful to Israel. He would bring them back from Babylon. Seventy years later, it's prophesied in Jeremiah as well. He would bring them back, and Israel would one day become a nation again, and they are still today. Um, and, And so God would honor from this remnant, from this stump, Israel would come back, but also we see the shoot shoot up, and that is a reference to Christ. Um. And so, from the book of Isaiah, Jesus the Messiah is referred to as this branch of the shoot. And this isn't the only passage. There's several passages that talk about him being the branch, the shoot that is going to come up out of the stump of Jesse. So who's Jesse, though? Who's Jesse? Jesse was the father of David. He's the father of David. 
And so your second principle there is that Isaiah anticipated that the Messiah would be from the lineage of David. He is the Lion of Judah. So he's going to come through that lineage of, uh, of David. All right? In fact, um, and so the, here's just a few interesting things. The Hebrew word, so you don't have to know this, but if you want to write it down, the Hebrew word for branch is nezer. All right? You can say that, right? Say nezer. Nezer, okay? Now, Matthew picks up on this, okay? And um, he says in Matthew 2.23, if you want to look at that, he says that um, Jesus is going to, um, he, after they, you know, Jesus, they have to flee to Egypt, right? After, because they're afraid for their lives. So they leave Bethlehem, they go to Egypt. After it's safe to come back, they're told in a dream and a vision to come back. So they come back and they settle in the town of? Nazareth, right? And so the, Matthew says, this is fulfillment that he shall be called a Nazarene. Well, there's no place in the Old Testament that says he will be called a Nazarene. What we do see is this Hebrew word, Nezer. Nezer, Nazarene. That's a word play, all right? And so, um, but Matthew also picks up that Nazareth was kind of this, this place out of the way. It's kind of like who came out of it. And you remember one of the dis- disciples, uh, Nathaniel, I says, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? So Nazareth was obscure. It was out of the way. It wasn't considered a place that you want to be from. But see, that's where Jesus would come. He, that would be his hometown. After Bethlehem, he would come out of Nazareth. And so Matthew plays on this, and he picks up on that, and he said he'll be called a Nazarene. And so we see that Isaiah, secondly, brings out that he would be from the lineage of David, and this, this idea of, of being from Nazareth, all right? And it all comes from this passage here in Isaiah chapter 11, that the shoot will come up out of dry ground. Let's look at number three. Um, you can turn back a page or two to Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 7. <clears throat> so you're having all these passages in Isaiah here that Isaiah is kind of called the gospel of the New Testament because of its accurate uh, prophecies concerning the Messiah. It says in verse 1 of chapter 9, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for where there is distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the, the land of Naphtali, so some of the tribes there in the north. But in the future, he will honor Galilee by the Sea of Galilee the, of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So Jesus would kind of, that'd be one, he came out of that area by the Sea of Galilee. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Who's that great light? And on those living in the deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation, increased their joy, and they, they rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boots is used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of his greatness and of his government, peace, there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding with justice and righteousness. And from that time and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so when we talk about Messiah, um, and, and so any Jewish person that was reading the Old Testament would see the Messiah overtones here, this Messiah that would come, that would lead with, would be the wonderful counsel, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace the everlasting Father, they saw the messianic overtones there and it really points to that time where Christ will rule and reign on earth and will bring peace when there has been no peace and He's going to rule and reign here on earth. And so that's what they were anticipating. That's what they were longing for. And you see that in the disciples. They're getting excited even on that day when they go into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, they're thinking, wow, this is awesome. The crowds are gathering. People are finally realizing that Jesus is the Messiah. And then Friday, he's crucified on the cross. And they go, what in the world just happened? We thought he was the Messiah. 
We thought he was the one that was going to deliver us, right? We see that Isaiah predicts that Jesus, the Messiah, would be a leader like no other before him. That's the third principle. He'd be a great leader. He'd bring hope. He'd bring light. He'd bring deliverance. He'd bring freedom. Um, He would lead with wisdom like no one else before him. He would have the mighty God. He's power, all-powerful. He would bring peace, and not only into our hearts, but into this world. And it would be for eternity. He's the eternal Father. And so there is some fulfillment of this because the minute you invite Christ into your heart and life, He brings His peace, amen? And He is the mighty God. When we come to Him in prayer and He he heals and He answers our prayers, He's the mighty God. And when Jesus performed miracles, it says that the kingdom of God had come to earth, right? The kingdom of God had come near. That was its reference throughout the Gospels. And so we get a taste of what it will be like when Jesus does rule and reign here on earth. Um, we got a taste of it, a picture, a, a, a smidgen of what it will be like when he is here. But we experience that now when Jesus is part of our heart. We experience his peace and we can go to him and we can find wisdom. When we don't understand things, we don't know what we should do, we can ask him for wisdom. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Jesus is here, but one day he's going to come that second time, all right? He's going to come that second time. He's going to you have the battle of Armageddon. So if you, I don't know how much, when I grew up in the church, it was just taught so much the end time events. And you don't hear a lot of teaching on end time events, but what you have to know is there's this tribulation, seven years we think, all right? Tribulation, if Jews, the Israels are going to experience tremendous tribulation, and that's when the Antichrist is going to come in. And, it's going to finally come to a head, and Jesus is going to come and rescue Israel. They're going to finally see the one that they have pierced, the one that they crucified. And they're going to say, hey, Jesus was the Messiah. They're going to cry out to him. God's going to come, and he, that's when the Revelation chapter 1, he's going to come on his white stallion. His eyes are blazing red. His hair is white, and he's going to come, and he's going to defeat the enemies that have risen up against Israel, and he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. That's called the millennial reign of Christ. All right, And it says those that are already with them that have been caught up in the rapture or that have died in the tribulation are going to rule and reign with him. All right, So God has a job description already written for you. Did you know that? All right, Your time here on earth is preparing you for your job in heaven. All right, So get good at what you're doing now because you know, God's, um, he has a job for you. But it says we'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years... Satan is finally destroyed, and we have the new Jerusalem and the new heavens. All right? That's in a nutshell, all right? Okay. He is going to be a leader like no other. Lastly, Isaiah points out um, one other key thing. I want us to go to Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Part of it does is on the end of chapter 52. Um, But we're going to pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 53 of Isaiah. There's what they call servant songs in the latter part of Isaiah. And this is one of what's called a servant song. And it says, Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a what? Tender shoot. Okay, the reference to the branch again. All right. Like a shoot out of dry ground, out of that obscurity out of Nazareth. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. He wasn't born out of wealth or prosperity, popularity. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I don't know if that means that Jesus wasn't good looking. I don't think so. I just think I just think it means that he wasn't anybody that says, you know, he wasn't this obvious leader coming out of kingly background or anything. He was despised and he was rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain, like no, uh, like one from whom people hide their faces. That's especially true as they took him to the cross, right? Where they, they, uh, he took the lashes and the crown of thorns, and people thought, you know, this who'd want to follow this guy going to the cross, right? He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. But verse four says, surely he took up our pain. 
and He bore our suffering. We considered Him punished by God and stricken by Him and afflicted. Why? Verse 5. Because He was pierced for whose transgressions? For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds or stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray and each of us has turned our own way and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And so we see here that Jesus would would take our sin, our punishment, our pain, our suffering when He went to the cross. And so lastly, Isaiah anticipated that the Messiah would suffer for the punishment of our sin. And this is the point that most Israel missed. And this was a, a difficulty. It was a stumbling block for the Jews and it was foolishness to the Gentiles. Paul will go into this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18-25 if you want to look that up later. But Paul says, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And see, the Jewish people had been looking forward to this Messiah, this ruler that would come, that would deliver them from their oppression and set them free and rule and reign on earth, on David's throne in Jerusalem. And and when he went to the cross, it's kind of like, what just happened? We thought he was the Messiah. And when they read through the Old Testament, they did not see that the Messiah, the suffering servant, would be one that would die on the cross for their sins. They totally missed that. And so that's why it was a stumbling block, and that for many of them, that's why they didn't see Jesus as their Savior, as their King, as their Messiah. Because He came from those humble circumstances and He died on the cross. But as see, He was, He had to suffer for us. He had to take our iniquity, our suffering, and our pain when He went to the cross. You know, and the worst thing is that these Jewish people would orchestrate His death and He would be hung on a Roman cross. But it wasn't for His sin, it was for our sin that He would die on the cross. But because He was willing to go, He opened the door for eternal life for you and I so that we could find faith, we could have eternal life, and we could know redemption. And best of all, we could know eternity with Him and have that relationship with Him. Not just your ticket to heaven, folks, but that you can walk with the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Creator of all the universe. Amen? And you can know Him. Let me have the musicians come. The Old Testament has a lot of prophecies that foretold, that anticipated the coming of the Messiah. And Isaiah especially has several that are picked up again and and confirmed in the New Testament. And they reveal that Jesus would be Emmanuel, that He would be God with us. One of the greatest truths about the Messiah. And that He would be from the lineage of David and that He would be a leader like no other. Not only in, in the future, in eternity, but also right here, right now. That He is here with us. And He can lead and direct in our lives. And lastly, to suffer the punishment for our sin. So that we can know eternal life. That we can know the hope of heaven. That we can know that our sins are forgiven. That that load's been lifted off of our life. And that we can walk with Him each and every day. Amen? And I don't know what truth you need to grab a hold of. There's kind of four of them there, at least. And maybe one of those just kind of zeroed in and hit you this morning. And just as we close this morning, I pray that you, that you just allow God just to take that truth and make it real to you and speak to you. Um, I believe one of those is connected with each of you today. Would you stand this morning? I'm going to lead us in a prayer of salvation. If you're here every day, every Sunday, you have no excuse to not get into heaven. Amen? And if you're listening online or, or maybe you just haven't, maybe you've been here and you just, it's been a process for you and you just haven't internalized it. You haven't said, Jesus, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. But maybe today God is speaking to you. I just encourage you not to put it off, but if God's speaking to you, to pray with us this morning and uh, just a salvation, a prayer of salvation. And then uh, I'm just going to pray for all of us. So let's just pray together. Um, just a prayer of salvation saying, dear God, Come into my heart and into my life. 
forgive me of my sin. And thank You that You went to the cross for me. That You bore my punishment and my shame. And thank You for the gift of eternal life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Amen. I believe if you believe that in all your heart and that was your prayer, I believe God just came in. He removed your sin. He removed that weight. And you're sensing His peace, His mercy, His goodness right now. And Father, I secondly just pray for each one here. Lord God, I don't know what the week looked like for each of us, but I believe there's people here that need to know that you are walking with them, that you understand their temptation, you understand their suffering, that you understand um, just what's in their heart right now, Lord God. Because you've walked through every stage of life that we've experienced, even death. Oh God, you, 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 you've been there. And so you understand you're God with us and you can walk with us through every event that we go through in this life. And Lord God, I know that um, you can give us the wisdom that we need and the peace that we need. And Lord God, when there's nothing else that can be done, you're the almighty God, the powerful God that can step into any situation in our life perform a miracle. And Lord God, I thank you that you came the first time, but you're coming again for your people, for all those who have long and anticipated your second coming. You're coming again, Lord, and Lord, help us to keep that in front of us, Lord God, that the Old Testament people, they were, they were anticipating the first coming, but Lord God, for us, we're anticipating that second coming. When you come for your church, for your, the, your bride, your people that are longing, that are waiting for you to come again, Lord. And Lord God, help us to be ready. Help us to be alert and maybe anticipating your second coming. Lord God, be with us here today. We give you the thanks. We ask this in your name. Amen. Join us in this closing course and just let God speak to you by his spirit. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought.
Some courses sound nice, um, but this, man, there's good theology, folks. If you know this song, you know a lot of theology that's written through Scripture. Um, very solid. Father, this morning, give us a heart that looks forward to Christmas. May it be more than just a holiday that we gather around a tree and open presents, but it is a time that we celebrate, we look forward when you came the first time, but also when you're coming that second time. And Lord God, give us a heart that longs, that anticipates that. Uh, and prepare our hearts, Lord God, for Christmas. So many of the people around us totally miss what Christmas is about. And Lord God, I pray that you would give us, um, just prepare our hearts so that we can share the hope within us with the people around us, Lord God, that just have no clue, that have no idea. Or maybe they've lost their way. And God, you've placed them uh, in our pathway that we can encourage them, that we can show Christ, that we can help maybe restore their faith and their commitment to you, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd be with us week. Just keep us safe, Lord God. Uh, Lord, we know that COVID is out there, but Lord God, you're so much greater than all that. And I pray you just keep your people safe. And we just, again, agree in prayer, Father, that for our state, for our communities, and for our nation, Lord God, um, you are the God that heals, and you're the God that protects us, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that not only us, but our nation would, would bow that knee that would come before you, and that we don't have this attitude that we're just going to defeat this on our own. Or, but, Lord God, that we, we cry out to our God that is able to heal and restore and, uh, Father, prepare our hearts to welcome you into our lives, into our homes, into our families. We give you the thanks. We ask in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless this morning. Greet each other as you leave. And good to have you at Radiant Springs Church this morning.